Right. So thank you, Colin, for the introduction. And thank you, Rick, for inviting me. I'm really happy to be speaking here. Um, yeah, and thanks everyone who was able to make it. I know things are crazy now, so yeah, thanks a lot. So um, I'm gonna be talking about approximate and discrete notions of vector bundle. Um, and the inspiration is taken from some applied or some examples in which you have something like a vector bundle and you want, to, you want it to be a vector bundle in order to compute some algebraic invariant of, of that object. So first of all, I'm gonna introduce the, the classical picture, vector bundles and characteristic classes. This is um, like classical math. Then uh, we'll see these examples that kind of look like bundles and we'll try to make sense out of those. And that is gonna be done in the third part where uh, we introduce approximate and discrete vector bundles which is joint work with Jose Perea. All right, so let's start. So what is a vector bundle and what are these characteristic classes? So a vector bundle is, uh, first of all, a continuous map. And usually the, um, the domain of the map is called the base and the domain is called the total space. And one is usually interested in vector bundles over some fixed base. Um, and in order for a continuous map to be a vector bundle, it has to satisfy a few properties. First of all, it has to have some rank D, which is going to appear in a second. Um, here it is. So the rank is going to be the dimension of the fiber, and the fiber should be some Euclidean um, vector space, some real vector space. So as a set, uh, Y, the total space, should be a disjoint union of many uh, Euclidean spaces. but as a topological space, Y can be much more interesting and really can be anything as long as this map is locally trivial. And in order to see what locally trivial means, let's look at a picture. So this is a vector bundle. This is the Mobius band seen as the total space of a vector bundle over the circle. And so first of all, we note that if you fix any point in the circle, the fiber is a uh, one dimensional Euclidean vector space. So that, that looks good. And uh, second of all, we wanted to we want to check that this is locally trivial. So how do we do that? We're gonna we you should be able to co in order for for it to be locally trivial, you should be able to cover the base by some opens, such that when you restrict the vector bundle to each of these opens, you get something that is trivial. And trivial in this case means that it is a product of the base and the fiber. So in this case, after you restrict the vector bundle, for example, to this open you get this piece, the total space is this piece, which is just the product of the base and the fiber. Um, okay, so that is a vector bundle. A standard example is the tangent bundle of a differentiable manifold, and this is it's gonna appear later. And just some notation, vector bundles, again, we are usually interested in vector bundles over some fixed base, and we denote the vector bundles up to isomorphism by vet D, this is the rank, of B. Very well. So um, the nice thing about vector bundles is that they can be defined in several a posteriori equivalent ways. And this is very useful in practice because sometimes you get a vector bundle, it doesn't, it is not given to you as a continuous map like this, but someone gives you a recipe for constructing the vector bundle. These recipes are known as cocycles. So again, a cocycle is at least in my view, a recipe for constructing a bundle, in this case, a vector bundle, and they work as follows. Suppose that you want to construct the Mobius one. You want to tell a friend, look, there's this really nice vector bundle, here's how you can build it. One way you can do that is you first tell your friend, look, fix the base to be the circle, and then cover your base by these opens. Um, and then if you want your vector bundles to trivialize over that uh, cover, what you're going to do is you're going to take each open of the cover and take a product with the fiber. And now we have these pieces and we want to glue them together in order to get the vector bundle. So if you want um, more specifically, if you look at a point in an intersection, it is going to have two fibers, one corresponding to each open uh, um, to which this point belongs to. And the thing that tells you how to glue these fibers is a cocycle. So um, in order to construct the vector bundle, you have to tell me how to glue these pieces like this. And this is done uh, with a function 
that uh, to each point of an intersection gives, uh, for each point in an intersection gives you an automorphism of the fiber. In this case, we're taking the automorphisms to be orthogonal transformations. You could take other linear maps, um, but in this talk, uh, vector bundles are gonna be given by orthogonal transformations. Um, okay, so in what way is this telling you how to glue? Well, if you have a point in an intersection, you have its two fibers, and the cocycle tells you how to go from one fiber to the other one. Um, and this is this, this linear map here. Okay, and is this all we have to do? Well, almost, there's one more thing we have to check. Um, and that is that this gluing makes sense. So we want to make sure that the gluings are consistent, which is ensured by the cocycle condition. And in a picture, uh, it, it means the following. So suppose that you have a triple intersection of your base and you have a point in the triple intersection. By the previous construction, one, one and two, this point is gonna come with before you glue it together, before you glue these fibers together, this point is gonna have three fibers. Now, uh, the cocycle tells you how to glue each pair of fibers. It tells you how to go from this fiber to this one, and from this one to this one, and et cetera. And the cocycle condition ensures that if you take this path to go from this fiber to this one, you get the same thing as if you take this path. And that is important. Uh, that, that's important because you want the gluing to be a well-defined equivalence relation, basically. Um, so that is all there is to know about the cycles for us. Uh, we're gonna denote them by Z1 of um, U or rather subordinate to U uh, with coefficients in the orthogonal group. These are usually known as check cycles. And again, these are just families of these maps. You have one map for each intersection. If the intersection is empty, then you don't have to do anything. And if it's not empty, then you have to tell me how to do the fibers. Um, and they have to satisfy the cycle condition. Okay. Um, so I said that uh, vector bundles can be given in several different ways. There's one more uh, way of specifying a vector bundle that we need to discuss. Um, ah, sorry. Before doing that, um, let me just um, tell you in what, in what sense cocycles are the same thing as vector bundles. So, um, the, the, the construction that we saw here, that given a cocycle gives you a vector bundle, can be summarized uh, like this. Given a cocycle, I take each of these opens, I take a product with a fiber, I take a disjoint union, and then I have to tell you how to glue those together. And that's done with this equivalence relation. Uh, so I'm quotienting this by this equivalence relation, and this is, this is the total space of the bundle. Um, so from cocycles, we get vector bundles. And you could ask me, are cocycles the same thing as vector bundles? And the answer is almost. You have to just fix one or two things. First of all, uh, you, you have to uh, kind of note that uh, if you make, if you have a change of basis here, if you change the basis of each fiber, then the vector bundle that you get is essentially the same. So this is here I'm being a bit imprecise because being precise would take too much time but there is a notion of change of basis, kind of fiber-wise change of basis, by which you can quotient and get um, this uh, check cohomology set subordinate to U, which is just a quotient of the set of all cycles subordinate to U. And uh, this construction extends in the sense that if you change basis, you get the same vector bundle. And there's yet another thing that you have to take into account. You cannot expect all vector bundles to trivialize over the same open cover. So if you allow me to take colimits over all over the posit of all covers of B, of my base space B, and this is usually called the check cohomology set of B with coefficients in the orthogonal group. If you allow me to do that, now the construction still extends and you get a bijection. So vector bundles over B are the same thing as these cocycles modulo these two uh, simple relations. And uh, if you want to be super precise, here you need B to be a, a reasonably nice uh, topological space. For example, you can assume that B is paracompact. But this is really just a detail in this talk. Uh, we're not going to care too much about that. So, um, okay, so this is the sense in which vector bundles can be given as cycles. 
And now we can go to classifying maps, which is the third way in which you can specify a vector one. So classifying maps. Um, the idea of classifying maps is the following. So before giving you that. So the idea of classifying maps is the following. You have your base space B and uh, a vector bundle over it is some space um, that in particular for each uh, point of your, of your race space uh, gives you a vector space because the fibers of, of this uh, continuous map should be vector spaces. And since this is continuous, you can sort of think that um, as you, for example, go from a point in B to another point of B, what you have is some continuous family of vector spaces that is changing continuously as you go along this path. The idea of classifying maps is to make that precise, is to construct another uh, topological space such that a, um, a vector bundle over B is the same thing as a map from B to this special topological space so that the points of this topological space are in some sense vector spaces and you can now more concretely see a path in B as giving you a parameterized, a continuously parameterized family of vector spaces. And this space here is called a Grassmannian. So there are many ways in which you can describe the Grassmannians. Here's one. Um, first, you, you fix some number, uh, some natural number n, and you consider the set, first of all, of d-dimensional subspaces of R to the n. This is a set, fine. And you can topologize this as follows. Um, you can first of all see the Grassmannian as a subset of this uh, set of matrices by identifying a d-dimensional subspace of Rn with the matrix that projects orthogonally onto it. There is exactly one matrix that does that. So uh, you can inject or include the Grassmannian in this uh, space of matrices. And now you can just topologize this, which there are many ways to do. Well, the topology is really the same one every time, but there are many metrics that give you that topology. One metric, one possible metric is the, is the one that uh, comes from the Frobenius norm. So the Frobenius norm is uh, a norm on this um, space of matrices. If you, if you never encounter a Frobenius norm, just think of the Euclidean norm. It is exactly the same one. It just has another name because we're talking about matrices. This gives you a topology here, so you get a topology here. And now, um, since Rn includes in Rn plus one, you can, uh, you can check that this gives you inclusions of the Grassmannian dn into the Grassmannian dn plus one, and you can take an increasing union and get the Grassmannian d of d-dimensional subspaces of, if you want, R infinity. And you can topologize this with a direct limit topology. So after you do all that, you can do the following. Given a cocycle, there's a formula which is not super important for us. All, all that matters here is that there is a formula that is not very complicated um, that assigns to each cocycle a continuous map from B to the Grassmannian. And if you now take cocycles up to these equivalence relations that we talked about before, and if you take maps to the Grassmannian up to homotopy, then these two things are the same. There's a bijection, a, a natural bijection between these two things. So uh, the conclusion of all of this is that vector bundles are the same thing as these cocycles up to a few things, which are also the same as classifying maps up to homotopy. And again, you need B to be uh, a, a relatively nice topological space. Okay, so what can you do with classifying maps? Classifying maps are very interesting because um, they let you define a lot of um, kind of algebraic uh, structure um, given a vector bundle. So an example of this is the one of characteristic classes. So this is what we just saw. And now we're gonna see a construction that, um, that assigns to each vector bundle some family of classes, of cohomology classes in the base space P. So you're given a vector bundle uh, over B, F, let's call it. And by this, uh, 
uh, by junctions, you have you you can get yourself a classifying map for f, which is just a continuous map from b to the Grassmannian. Now, given any element in the cohomology of the Grassmannian, let's call it c, you can use the classifying map to pull back that element to the um, cohomology of p. That's just the functorial action of cohomology. It's contravariant, so co elements in the cohomology of the Grassmannian go to elements in the cohomology of p. All the elements that you can get in that uh, using that are called characteristic classes of f. And the point of this construction is that if you have two vector bundles that are isomorphic, then the characteristic classes that you get are exactly the same. This is just because if you have two vector bundles here that are isomorphic, then the classifying maps are going to be homotopic, and thus they are going to pull back precisely the same cohomology classes. So you can use um, ca characteristic classes to distinguish vector bundles. So characteristic classes are invariants of vector bundles. And let me give you two examples of characteristic classes. Uh, you have the, the Stiefel Whitney classes. You have one for each i, a natural number. So you have the i, Stiefel Whitney class. And what it does is it uh, takes a vector bundle that here I'm seeing as a cocycle and returns a, an element in the i cohomology group of B with coefficients in Z mod two. And the other example that we are going to be interested in is the Euler class, which takes an oriented vector bundle. So I didn't talk about orientations for vector bundles, but there is a, a pretty simple notion of, of what, what it means for a vector bundle to be orientable and what it means to be oriented. And you can check that having an oriented vector bundle is the same thing as describing a vector bundle with a cocycle taking values in the special orthogonal group. And the Euler class takes a rank D oriented vector bundle and returns an element in the D cohomology of B with coefficients in Z now. So um, it doesn't really matter uh, too much like the details here. The point is that there are these classes that give you elements in the cohomology of the base given a vector bundle. So what can you do with these classes? For example, the most uh, kind of simple example is that if you have a vector bundle and any of its uh, characteristic classes are non-zero, you compute some characteristic class and you get non-zero, then the vector bundle cannot be trivial. It is not the case that the total space is the product of the, of the base and the fiber. It has to be more complicated than that. Another simple example, the first Stiefel Whitney class tells you precisely if you can orient your vector bundle. And um, if the Euler class is non-zero, then your vector bundle does not admit a nowhere vanishing section. And just as an application of this, this is a very uh, well-known application, the Euler class of the tangent bundle of the two sphere is non-zero. And what that tells you is that there is not a nowhere vanishing section of the two sphere, of the tangent model of the two sphere, and that is known as the Harry Wall theorem. That tells you that you cannot comb a ball. There's always going to be some kind of uh, vortex. Okay, so this is the classical picture. Let's see how vector bundles arise in applications. So I have a question mark here because at the first glance, it's not gonna be obvious if the things that we are gonna look at are vector bundles or not. So um, a, a pretty nice source of, of interesting topological spaces uh, is uh, the attractors of, comes from the attractors of, of, or comes from studying the attractors of a dynamical system. And here I'm gonna be pretty informal because being formal here is not easy and it would take too much time. So. For us, a dynamical system is just gonna be, uh, it's, it's gonna consist of a phase space, which is gonna be just a topological space and some action. And you can think of this as time acting on your space by kind of moving your, the point in your phase space uh, according to the dynamics of the dynamical system. Now, um, an attractor of a dynamical system is an invariant subset of the phase space that has some attracting property in the sense that, so you have your phase space and you have an attractor and a subset is an attractor if it's invariant, meaning that if you have a point in it and you act with a dynamical system, you get another point in it. 
and it is attracting in the sense that things that are sufficiently close to it, when you act with a dynamical system, they get closer and closer to the attractor. And these things appear in, in practice, so it is, uh, and it's a very good way to distinguish, for example, dynamical systems. Um, okay, so what we want to do is to study some very simple attractors of a relatively simple dynamical system using topology. And in particular, we're gonna be given some particle in the dynamical system, and we're gonna want to study the topology of the attractor this particle is converging to. So if you want to uh, Jose's uh, talk, Jose Peria's talk, you will have seen this recipe. There's a recipe for constructing point clouds out of time series that lets you recover uh, the topology of these attractors in good cases. So again, we have this particle in the phase space. The first thing that we, that we do is just act with time at, at discrete time intervals, and we get a sequence of particles in the phase space. Now, usually you don't really have access to the phase space. All you can do is measure something about the particle. You have some device, some physical device that measures something, and that measurement maybe is just a real number. So really what you have access to is a sequence of measurements of this particle um, that, that kind of evolved in time. So you, all you really have is just a time series. You have a real value time series. Now, given any real value time series, you have this uh, delay embedding construction, which uh, the formula is not super important. Uh, the main thing is that it is a kind of a recipe that given a, a time series returns a point cloud. And for that, you have to choose two parameters. You have to choose the delay and you have to choose the target dimension. So here, we're not going to worry about that. We, we're just going to assume that we know roughly how to fix those parameters. So we, we have this particle that is moving in time and we only have some measurements, discrete measurements of the evolution. And we use this uh, embedding, uh, the delay embedding thing to get a point cloud. And now there's a theorem by Takens that take, tells you that in good cases, and here, uh, and, and this is super informal, you have, you have to work a lot to like prove that you're in the good cases, but let's just assume that. Um, in good cases, this point cloud that you constructed using just these measurements is gonna be concentrated around the diffeomorphic copy of the attractor. So the attractor really lives in this phase space, but there is some diffeomorphic copy of the attractor inside R to the N that has this, the same, uh, such that X is uh, concentrated around that. So you can use uh, tools from persistent theory, for example, Vitoris Rips complexes to try to recover the topology of this attractor. So let me give you an example. This is a dynamical system called the double gyre. Uh, the phase space, um, well, actually, let's, let's look at the double gyre. So in a second. This is the double gyre. I hope you can see that. Um, so the double gyre is a dynamical system that changes in time. As you can see, you have these two vortices that are moving left to right. And here I put two points at some initial condition and the points are moving according to the flow. And the, the movement of the, of the points is not super regular because the dynamical system is changing in time. So you can see that the, the, the red ball is moving pretty kind of weirdly. It, it gets closer to the center and then further away. Whereas the blue one is a bit more um, kind of symmetric, the movement. Okay, so that's the double gyre. Um, and the phase space, one of the important things here, the phase space of this dynamical system is not just this rectangle, but is uh, this rectangle times the circle, because since this dynamical system is changing in time, the tra trajectory of a particle doesn't only depend on where the point is, but it also depends on at what time the point is there because this dynamical system is changing in time. And since the change is periodic, then time is really periodic. So that's the phase space of the particle. In order to know where the particle is going to go, you have to know where it is and at what time it is there. Okay, and we want to study the, the attractors of the blue ball and the red ball. So if you use uh, this uh, kind of uh, delay embedding construction, what you get is something like this. 
these are really shapes living in some high dimensional space, I think R to the five in our uh, example. But you can, in this case, since things are not too crazy, you can project them down uh, to R2 and see pretty well what's happening. So this is the attractor of the blue ball, which is the pretty regular one. And this is the attractor, this one is the attractor of the red ball. And they look pretty similar. If, um, I mean, both are pretty circular, that's clear. But if you look at it closely, this really looks like just a band. I mean, it's a circle times R. Whereas this one, as you go around the circle, in particular kind of here, you are changing orientation. So this really looks more like a Mobius band. But if you look at the homology, if you compute the persistence homology of this, you're not going to see that because homology doesn't distinguish the band and the Mobius band. Uh, here, you clearly see that there's just one one dimensional hole. And here you have two holes but they are at very different distance scales. And really this second hole appears just because of this embedding. This embedding is not super nice. It's like kind of wrapped around itself. So when you look at a bigger distance scale, you're gonna get another hole. So if you really care about intrinsic topology, you should forget about this part. And now the two things look very similar and there's no way to distinguish them using just uh, homology. So homology cannot distinguish these. But the tangent bundle should distinguish this. This thing is orientable and this thing isn't. So can we, can we somehow uh, compute a vector bundle, compute a characteristic class of this vector bundle and see that these two things are not uh, the same? So how can we approximate a vector bundle? Or rather, how can we approximate a tangent bundle? One way to do that is to use PCA, principal component analysis. Principal component analysis tries to approximate a data set uh, by a linear subspace, right? And um, you can think of a uh, differentiable manifold as locally being linear. And so what we're, going to, what we're going to do is to try to approximate a tangent bundle by locally using PCA. That's the local PCA um, idea. So they're gonna take your point cloud. One way to do local PCA, this is a pretty well-known uh, construction. So there are many ways to do this. I'm gonna describe a pretty uh, simple one. You're gonna take your uh, point cloud. You're gonna choose some um, kind of neighbors or neighborhood for each point. In this case, I'm using K nearest neighbors, but you could, you could use other things. So for each point, I take a neighborhood and now I consider just this data set. The data set consisting of these K neighbors of, of X. And I do the same thing for Y and any other point in, in the data set X. Now I apply PCA just to these neighborhoods. And what I get is, um, I, in this case, in this picture, a one dimensional approximation of this data set. Okay, and if I want, I can ask uh, PCA to not only give me a subspace, but also give me some orthonormal basis for this subspace. So, um, in this case, the basis is just gonna consist of one vector. And um, if I translate everything to the, uh, to the origin, the, um, the tangent uh, at Y is gonna be like something like this. And there's gonna be some basis that are, I fix once and, uh, once and for all when I do the local PCA computation. And I have some basis for um, the tangent at X. Now, um, if I want to go from the tangent at X to the tangent at Y, what I can do is basically just do an orthogonal projection. So if, if you, if you uh, consider this matrix, this matrix is just the orthogonal projection from the orthogonal, uh, the, the tangent uh, at Y to the tangent at X. And now I can approximate that um, linear transformation by an orthogonal transformation. Here I use, for example, the Frobenius metric and find the closest orthogonal transformation to this linear transformation. So in this case, in this example, the orthogonal transformation that I get is minus one because I'm basically changing the orientation when I move from the tangent that X to the tangent that Y. And why am I doing all this? Why am I approximating these linear transformations by orthogonal ones? Because this starts to look like a vector bundle. If I have three points now, X, Y, and Z, and if these points are sufficiently close, then what I expect is that if I change, if I go from the tangent at X 
to the tangent that y, and then from the tangent that y to the tangent that x, uh, at z, sorry, x, y, and z. If I do uh, this and then this, that should be pretty similar to doing this directly. And you can convince yourself thinking about these projections. Those should have that property. And when I take closest orthogonal uh, transformations, those should also have that property. So what I got myself is something like a cocycle. It's some discrete and approximate version of a cocycle. Um, in particular, uh, by the picture that I just drew, um, if you choose some small enough delta, then these, uh, these matrices that we define define some sort of approximate cocycle over the Vietoris Rips complex of X. And we're going to make that precise later. So don't worry if this is vague, uh, because it is vague. It's going to be precise later. So all uh, the, the most important here, uh, thing here is that given something like a differential manifold, you can get something like a cocycle that should approximate the tangent bundle. So let me give you another example of uh, something that looks like a bundle. Suppose that you have a synchronization problem. And very roughly speaking, a synchronization problem uh, is a problem of, of the following sort. You have some independent measurements of usually the same object. And maybe each measurement has only partial information of the whole object. And you want to, in some way, align them to get global information about the object. An example is, um, it is an example from biology, cry cryogenic electron microscopy where um, you have 2D projections of a molecule. So uh, the molecule lives in 3D and you have uh, projections of it taken uh, from different angles. And the problem with these projections that look maybe like this, this is a very simplified picture. This is something that I generated synthetically. Um, the problem with these pictures is that they come unlabeled you don't know the angle from which these pictures were, ta were taken from. And that's just a, a problem with the, with the experiment is set up. The, the, the scientist doesn't have the kind of, they, they cannot fix the molecule in a certain orientation and then take a picture. The molecule is just floating around and you take a picture and you don't know which angle the molecule was at. So you get this uh, unlabeled set of uh, projections and you want to do something with it. For example, recover the global structure of the molecule. Um, one thing that happens with these pictures is that they are usually pretty noisy. And one way to fix that is to find uh, projections that were taken from similar angles and average them so that you can sort of cancel the noise. If you average noisy things, uh, noisy kind of pictures of the same thing, the, the noise tends to average out and only the important features stand out. So you may think, okay, let's just uh, align everything together, just put all the pictures, in, like align them together and now take a big average and that's the molecule. And obviously you're gonna tell me that doesn't make sense. What if I, I try to average a picture like this with a picture like this? These two, thing, these two things are not, not, are not compatible. You're not gonna be able to, to um, align them properly. So um, the idea here is to motivate this fact that there are uh, problems in which you cannot align everything at the same time. And what we want to do with a, with a bundle is to realize that your data cannot be aligned all at the same time. In this case, you know exactly where the pictures came from and you know that you're not gonna be able to align it all at the same time, but there are going to be applications in which you don't know if you can align everything at the same time. And before trying to do that, you would, you would like to have some, uh, some computation that you can carry out that tells you, yes, this is, uh, hope, or rather, no, this is hopeless, or yes, maybe we should try to do it. So how can you do that? We're going to uh, assign to each uh, synchronization problem a bundle, and that bundle is going to be trivial precisely when you can, uh, when there is global synchronization. So what you can do is to align locally. This is easy. Given uh, each pair of images, you can find the best, in this case, uh, rotation that aligns them using some distance between images. You choose your, you pick your favorite one. Now, uh, given any pair of images, you can uh, compute the distance between uh, the image and the best alignment of the other one. And you got yourself a metric space and you can compute this Vietoris-Rips complex, for example. 
Now, the topology of this Pieter's Ritz complex is going to tell you, in some sense, how complicated is the space of kind of possible angles. Um, okay. Now, again, you expect these alignments to satisfy an approximate cocycle condition over this um, simple shell complex. And the reason is that, again, if you have three pictures and you can align this very well, these very well, and these very well, then if your molecule doesn't have symmetries, um, this composite alignment should be very similar to this alignment. So again, you got yourself something like a uh, bundle, like a vector bundle, and uh, you can check that uh, in, this, uh, kind of in this analogy, global synchronization corresponds to this bundle being trivial. So let me show you a picture of what the persistent homolo cohomology of this uh, vitreous rich complex looks like. It, uh, it looks like a two sphere, basically because there, is no one there are no one dimensional holes and the two dimensional holes, there's really just a big one. Um, so what if we could compute a characteristic class of this bundle and if it was non-zero, then we would be able just from the data to tell this data set cannot be globally synchronized. Okay, so let's, let's make all of this precise. And we are going to just start by uh, basically axiomatizing the things that we found in the examples. So we're gonna first define what it is a uh, discrete approximate cycle. So we're gonna fix a simple complex here and we're gonna consider the discrete epsilon approximate cycles over it. And these are gonna be exactly what we found in the applications. So uh, given your simple complex, what you want to have is for each edge, for each one simplex, a matrix, an orthogonal matrix. And uh, every time you have a two simplex, you want, uh, here, IK, you want this composite to be sufficiently close to this. And we are going to parameterize this sufficiently close with a uniform parameter, epsilon. And here we have to choose some metric between matrices and we'll just use the Frobenius metric. You could use other metri uh, metrics if you wanted, but this one has particularly nice theoretical properties. Um, okay, so a discrete epsilon approximate cycle is just this family of matrices, one for each edge of your simple shell complex. Um, we, we denote all epsilon approximate cycles by this. This is discrete uh, epsilon approximate cycles. And now um, you can again quotient by this, by this notion of, uh, again, informally change of basis. And you get yourself this epsilon approximate uh, coho uh, check cohomology set um, of K with values in the orthogonal group. And something that is quite useful in the approximate setting is that this inherits a metric. And it inherits the metric from, this, uh, from the coefficients. Basically, you're just uh, doing like a, an, an L infinity metric over all, over all edges. Now, uh, before giving you the first main theorem, uh, let me give you this lemma. So recall that we constructed this Grassmannian as a subspace of R infinity times, uh, R infinity times infinity, so this infinite dimensional matrices. You can uh, thicken this Grassmannian, meaning you have the Grassmannian, you can basically just put a ball of radius uh, square root of two divided by two uh, on each element, on each point of this Grassmannian, and you get a bigger space. And if you do this with this radius and not more, then you can retract this space back to the Grassmannian. So you can, I mean, this picture should be fairly convincing that if your space is sufficiently nice, if you're thickening, you can retract it back. For the Grassmannian, you can do it up to square root of two divided by two. Okay, so now we can see uh, the, the first main theorem. So recall that there was this map that I briefly explained that given a um, cocycle gives you a classifying map, you can extend this map so that given an approximate cocycle, what you get is something like an approximate classifying map. So instead of being able to go from your uh, space to the Grassmannian, since the cocycle is not exact, then you have to go some thick, to some thickening of the Grassmannian. There is some error so that you cannot land exactly on the Grassmannian, but you can land pretty close. Um, 
This map not only extends the classical map, it is stable, and this is useful in practice, because if you started with a pretty similar co-cycle, you're gonna get a very similar uh, classifying map. And now using this lemma, you can retract back this Grassmannian as long as epsilon is sufficiently small. In this case, it has to be less than one half. You can retract the Grassmannian back to the usual Grassmannian. And now you got yourself a map from the uh, simplicial complex or the, top, uh, the, the right, geometricalization of the simplicial complex to the Grassmannian. And this is, as we saw in the beginning of the talk, uh, in bijection with the vector bundles over K. So given a sufficiently, uh, uh, rather uh, an approximate cycle with epsilon sufficiently small, you got yourself a true vector bundle. And this construction is stable. So if your data was fairly different or like uh, just a, a little bit different, then you're gonna get yourself the same vector bundle. So this is a theoretical construction that ensures you that um, there is really an, an underlying vector bundle, even if your thing is not exactly a cycle. And you can, you can use this uh, construction to, to see that you can actually, um, any vector bundle over a finite simplicial complex can be given as, a, um, as an approximate cycle if you allow me to maybe subdivide the, the simplicial complex. Okay, so this is just a theoretical thing. It tells us there is some vector bundle underlying this uh, kind of thing that appeared in practice. Can you do anything with it? Well you can at the very least compute some characteristic classes. So we have algorithms that given um, an approximate cycle, give you back uh, an element in the first cohomology of your um, simplicial complex, an element in the second cohomology. And if your, um, if your vector, if your approximate cycle takes values in the, in the rotation, in the two dimensional rotation group, then um, you also have an Euler class that gives you an element in the second cohomology of K with coefficients now in the integers. And these algorithms work when epsilon is sufficiently small. So in this case, you can actually get your epsilon to be bigger than the one in the theorem here, but it still has some uniform bound. It doesn't depend on K, but uh, I mean, you need to satisfy that bound, otherwise the algorithm doesn't work. Um, okay, these are algorithms, fine. Are they computing anything in real life in the sense like what are they computing? Well, these algorithms are first of all stable. So if you start with something similar, you get exactly the same cohomology class and they are consistent in the sense that if epsilon is sufficiently small, has to be smaller than these things, then you're computing the, the characteristic classes of this vector bundle that we constructed here. So if you combine the two theorems, you know that there is some underlying true vector bundle underlying this approximate uh, co-cycle, and uh, you can compute some characteristic classes of it. And these algorithms are, uh, I mean, fairly, uh, they work in practice. They are all polynomial in the number of vertices, and um, this one works really well, even if D is large, whereas this one doesn't really work when D is large. This, is, this one is exponential in D. But, there are lots of, of interesting problems that can be phrased where the, the structure group is a, a low dimensional orthogonal group. Okay, so maybe let me uh, give you, since I think I have some time, let me give you an idea of how these algorithms work. Um, the idea is to basically follow a classical construction, but you have to be pretty careful in tracking uh, all the approximations. So. There is a, a classical construction that given a short exact sequence or rather a central extension of groups and given a, a check one cycle here, they give you back an element in the cohomology, in the second cohomology with coefficients in this uh, group. That's usually known as the connecting morphism and, and the low dimensional characteristic classes can often be uh, be constructed or rather, yeah, be, be computed using this um, connecting morphism. So what we do is we extend this in the case where uh, these groups, now you need a metric to keep track of uh, approximations. Um, so given a central extension of Lie groups, if you have this group, if, if this group is com compact and this one is discrete, 
and now you have a relatively nice cover of, of your base space and you have some parameter epsilon that is sufficiently small and here in this case uh, smallness is quantified using the cisto of h which is the length of the shortest non-null homotopic path of h for example if, if you're working on the circle um, and if you, if you take a circle uh, whose um, perimeter is uh, 2 pi, then the system is 2 pi. So if you have a, if you have these uh, Lie groups and you have an epsilon uh, such that eight, eight epsilon is smaller than the system of H, then you have a connecting morphism that takes a check, an approximate check cohomology uh, co-cycle over U and returns a, uh, an element in the second cohomology of, um, well, rather if you want, you can put B here with coefficients in F. And we use this construction with these um, short exact sequences. This one gives you the Euler class and this one gives you the second stiefel winnie class. The first stiefel winnie class is actually much easier to, to compute. So this, this is the construction for the more interesting ones. Um, okay, so let's, let's conclude by uh, using these algorithms on the examples. So one example, in one example, we wanted to distinguish these two um, uh, kind of discretizations of these topological spaces, the band and the Mobius band, and we had these persistence diagrams which didn't let us distinguish these two things. Now, um, applying local PCA to these point clouds, I mean, you don't see this, but this is really a point cloud. Uh, we apply local PCA to it. We get this approximate co-cycle. And now basically we go the furthest that we can go in the aviatory strips filtration of this data set, such that the co-cycle is a two approximate co-cycle. And I mean, here we are taking epsilon equals to two and that's so that we can apply our algorithms. Um, we apply the algorithm, in this case, the first default winning class and we get a cohomology class on the Vitor strips complex at this distance scale with coefficients in Z mod two. And now what we can do is um, write the class that we got in the basis given by the persistent cohomology basis. So in this case, um, we write this class in that basis and we circle the classes that appear in um, such that, such that uh, sum to this. So I'm taking all the persistent cohomology features such that when you sum them together, you get this. And I'm circling those. In this case, I'm not circling anything. And that's because the class that you get in this case is just zero. And that reflects the fact that this is orientable. Whereas here, I do the same computation and uh, have a, a, an element in the first cohomology with coefficients in Z mod two and pick the points such that when you sum them together, you get this. And in this case, you get some points here and you get this one too. And this is really reflecting the fact that as you go around this circle, which is represented by this basically, um, the local PCA computation is changing orientation. After you do this, you end up with the, the, with the opposite orientation. And this, um, this region that I'm uh, gray, that I have in gray here um, is kind of the region that contains all the classes that can potentially sum to this. So this is just kind of a sanity check. This, is, this, doesn't, ap this doesn't appear in the, um, as a sum of, of, of this class um, because it, this is just zero. It is not, it, it doesn't appear, um, yeah, it doesn't appear because it's, because this is zero. And it's not the case that it doesn't appear because we just didn't consider it. I mean, that, that was kind of vague. So we can talk about that later maybe. Um, and then to show you the second example, we wanted to detect the lack of global synchronization from data. And in this case, we had these uh, images that we synchronized with the rotations. Um, we constructed this metric space and this is the persistence diagram of that metric space. And the rotations themselves gave us this approximate cycle. So we can, again, take the, the largest delta such that this is still a one approximate in this case, because we want to apply the, the Euler class algorithm. And we do that. And again, we write this in the persistent cohomology basis. And in this case, 
uh, this is literally just this class. So that's clearly very non-zero, and thus there is no global synchronization for cryo uh, electron microscopy. And if you want to understand this topologically, I said that basically this was a two-sphere, and uh, the tangent bundle, the Euler class, ended up being uh, non-zero. So really what we have here is a tangent bundle of the two-sphere that comes from all these projections. Um, and yeah, and that's, those are the two uh, examples. And here are some references. This is the paper that we I have been discussing. There's some code um, that lets you run these examples. And yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you very much for an excellent, excellent talk. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, Healy. Hey, Luis. I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, thank you very much for giving it. Quick question, uh, scalability of the local PCA. Uh, what's the complexity of the algorithm and how well does it scale to large amounts of data, like big point clouds? Um, I mean, it, it depends a lot on how you choose the neighborhoods. If, yeah. I mean, it, it is just PCA. I'm not, uh, first of all, I, I didn't, like we didn't, uh, kind of develop this local PCA uh, framework. I can I, I can then send you some papers that use it. Um, I did it in a, in the very naive way uh, where you just um, I mean partition your data set in some way and then apply PCA. I'm not like reusing any computations or anything. It's like a okay. very basic framework and it works pretty fast. I mean PCA is pretty fast if if you don't apply to a, an immense point cloud. And since you're doing a local thing. Um, like a k, k nearest neighbors thing, you have a very good control over how many points you're going to be applying PCA to. So it is really quite fast. Cool. Clustering your data before doing the local linear fe feels like a nice way to speed it up. I, I right, that, right. That so uh, yeah, maybe what I wouldn't do, what I did, but I wouldn't do in a huge point cloud is to have a neighbor, a neighborhood for each data point. Good. Uh, I would, yeah, exactly, as you said, like partition, you, you want overlap, that's very important. You, you cannot just cluster, like uh, destroying clusters. You want overlap because if you want to understand at least these changes in, in uh, tangent spaces, then there, there has to be some overlap, otherwise it's gonna be very hard. I mean, it's not clear that uh, kind of clusters that are close by are gonna have similar tangent, tangent spaces. Yeah, and so yeah, I was trying to figure out if there were good ways to figure out what that subsampling across your manifold should be, because I, I would agree with you. I, you don't want to do it for every point. It's expensive. Right. Cool. Um, I think that's an interesting question. We can, I can send you some references later. I appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, next up, Doug. Uh, hi, Louis. Excellent talk. Thank you so much. Um, I also, it's nice to actually have both of you present you twice on this because I think you really pick different slices. Uh, and I think there's a clear connection of what I'm interested in and what you're doing in terms of like what I actually work on is building constructively dynamical systems. Um, and I think we should talk more about that because I, I have very basic examples of how you can this, get the orientation in linear mm -hmm. cases. So it doesn't have to be some nonlinear dynamical system. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I'm very interested in that. But uh, my question is a little bit more vague and less specific in that uh, it's very cool to have a way to s say that, look, you, the, the kind of projections out of your data you have are insufficient to reconstruct uh, your topology, mm -hmm. right? So the next question is, can you give a, a recipe what people should do to fix it, right? Do you need to sample in a higher dimensional space? Do you need to just add another projection at a different angle? Like what are the recipes for making it into a constructive tool from where you got, which is very cool, by the way. Right, right. So, I mean, I think now you're talking about the like uh, synchronization problem, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So. 
Uh, so one way in which I hope this can be used is to, in some sense, give you an, an, an idea of how well covered, um, how, how well you covered things with your projections. Like maybe for some reason, you didn't cover half of your, of your sphere. And in that case, the, the Euler class is gonna be zero because in that case, you can trivialize the bundle. So if you got your Euler class to be zero, then you know that you didn't have well covering. Um, but and unless the data in sort of inherently has a torsion in it, right? So you, you sampled a, a Klein bottle in four space and it actually has a twist in it and then you would always have it even if you add more projections, right? Uh, I think things get complicated if you have symmetries. Okay. Um, so this is, this is in some sense very simplified because you have to assume that you don't have symmetries to get a result like this. If you have symmetries, the problem that you're gonna have is that the, um, the local synchronization is not unique. Given two images, if there is a symmetry, there might be two optimal ways of, and right. so that's, that's also something that I, I'm thinking about and I think this can be useful for that but I don't really have anything precise to say about that right now. Awesome, thank you. Very, very cool. We should definitely talk way more about a lot yeah, of I'll things. Yeah, I'll be happy to. All right, <laughs> thanks. Welcome. Um, William asks in the chat, is there any hope for computing higher SW classes or Pontryagin classes? I would say that, I mean, this is, this is something that a very big mathematicians have done in the past, and it's not easy. Uh, the, the, um, the formulas that I've seen are usually for manifolds. I mean, there are uh, like fairly explicit formulas for higher uh, characteristic classes for manifolds. They're not very simple, and uh, it is not clear how algorithmic they are, they are, because sometimes they say, okay, here put a one, if this cohomology class is zero, and it's like maybe some singular cohomology class that you don't really have any way of computing with an algorithm. So I would say there is some hope, but maybe not a lot, I don't know. And I think there's some hope for uh, the highest Stephen Winnie class and the highest Euler class. And I'll be happy to talk about that later. That's a good guess. <laughs> well, in steroid operations, steroid operations do act, so that could be of some help in doing calculations. Right, right. right. Yeah, I would guess what you do for the other class may well work for the highest uh, Stephen Whitney class. Right. Yeah, and, and it's the basic like obstruction to a global, uh, to a section, a nowhere vanishing section. Yeah. And uh, you could think of uh, working with complex line bundles as well as uh, SO2 bundles. And uh, if there's a reason, extend uh, to the very nice formalism of churn classes. Right, right. Uh, that is something that we have in, in the to-do list also. Yeah, that's to do. <laughs> Lovely talk. Thank you, thank you for coming. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've got time for Marcus, no problem. Hey, very nice talk. Um, have you thought about using connections and uh, churn by theory to compute your characteristic classes? So, um, I mean, yes, the thing is, I, I am not a geometer. And as far as I understand, connections are really like, I don't know what a connection is if your base space is not a manifold, basically. And I'm sure there's some way around that. Um, but if you have any references, I'll be happy to see, like check that because yeah, I mean, the, the fact like these matrices that you have uh, really look like more like a connection because they tell you how to go from a vertex to another one, right? Um, but what's a connection if your race space is just a topological space? Is there like a nice formalism for that? Well, I think you, uh, you imagine a connection as a parallel transport map. Um, between the different points. So that's an equivalent way to encode it. But I mean, there's still some challenge to get a cohomology class out of that then. Right, right. 
um, yeah, so the answer is it would be very nice. But I don't know how to do it. Thanks. Very good answer. <laughs> any, more, any more questions? Okay, let's thank Luis again.